Okay, it's uh, two o'clock and uh, we are ready to uh, rock and roll. Uh, the m cubed uh, seminar uh, this week is uh, can be given by James Doan. James got his PhD in uh, 2003 from the University of Reading uh, under, the, under the supervision of George Craig and Suzanne Gray. For his PhD, he studied uh, the dynamics and predictability of MCSs over the UK and he had a not many to choose from, so you narrowed down your, your, your case study. Uh, it was two, all right. <laughs> uh, after his PhD, he visited the uh, U.S. to join the, the BOECO and mesoscale convective uh, vortex experiment, Baymex. Uh, he came to NCAR to analyze uh, some of the Baymex wharf model runs and uh, never left, fortunately for us. He now heads uh, MCUBE's Capacity Center for Climate and weather extremes at C3WE, not to be confused with Scripps's uh, three CW3E. Uh, he is also a senior academic uh, fellow of uh, the Willis Research Network. In this uh, fellowship, he conducts research on high impact weather with the insurance industry. And we'll hear uh, some of that today. We'll hear a lot about that today in this uh, talk entitled The Response of Tropical Cyclone Intensity to changes in environmental temperature. James. Great, well thanks Rich, and uh, yeah, welcome everyone. Great to see so many of you, and welcome everyone joining remotely. <clears throat> yes, I'm pleased to have this opportunity to talk about this work I did with Gary Lackman from NC State, and Andy Prine here in M Cubed. Um, so Gary visited on, under the support of the MQ Visitor Advisory Committee. So thanks again for that uh, support for his visit. He visited in February 2020. And so as we know, 2020 went downhill pretty rapidly. So he, he, when NCAR closed, he hung around for a week or two and then realized nothing was going to change. So we drove back to uh, North Carolina. But we're able to continue collaborating and uh, finally got the work published here in Weather and Climate Dynamics. So uh, big thanks to uh, Rafael Rousseau-Rizzi, who uh, gave a really nice review of uh, the paper. And thanks also to Chris, who saw a very early version of this work and pointed us to some theory that was um, relevant. Now, my portion of this work was funded by the reinsurance industry. So uh, I'm going to provide twin motivation, scientific and societal, from their view. And at the very, very end, once I've presented the paper, I'm going to say a few words about how that interaction works and how I think we can um, benefit uh, more broadly from an inter a relationship with the reinsurance industry. OK, so I can't talk about hurricanes right now without mentioning uh, the 2020 hurricane season. So back in June, um, all the major forecasting centers were going for a very active season. Sometimes sometimes referred to as a hyperactive season, mainly based on La Nina. So this is the third year in a row we're in La Nina. Um, and then in early August, NOAA still expected above normal Atlantic hurricane season. Now, that was expectation. And then reality as of a week ago, so this point would have been better made a week ago, but um, here's a time series of a measure of hurricane activity in the North Atlantic the accumulated cyclone energy, which is an integrated measure of numbers of storms, duration, and intensity. The gray lines are historical years. <coughs> this is cumulative. And the red line was this year, as of a week ago. And you can see it's right at the bottom. And in fact, it was the second lowest activity since decent records began in the late 50s. So, um, and thanks to Steve Bowen for tweeting this, this graphic. As we know, things have exploded since, and I think Earl is probably a, must be a major hurricane about now. But just to make the point that there's still things to learn about the interaction between tropical cyclones and its environment and it, the, the whole system's predictability. And the insurance industry is really uh, keen to understand what's going on in the current world at a process level, so they asked me to write blog posts on their, um, their sites to interpret real-time events. So more on that uh, later. OK, so firstly, some scientific motivation for understanding the relationship between TCs and their environment. Um, 
So the primary motivation is that TCs have indeed changed. So this isn't something we're waiting to happen. It's already, changes have already been detected in the historical observations. Um, so I'm going to make some sweeping statements, uh, primarily based on Tom Newton's summary, recent summary papers based on over 90 peer-reviewed papers. Um, so firstly, some global statements. So it has been detected that uh, there's been an increase in the lifetime maximum intensity per storm. Um, we've detected faster intensification. So this means that storms are reaching their peak intensity sooner. And you could think about it that the 24-hour rates of intensification are now happening um, quicker. We've detected an increase in the proportion of the strongest storms. So looking at all storms together, there's a shift. So storms that come along today are more likely to be intense, less likely to be um, weak than they otherwise were. And this, these are statements since the 1970s. Uh, that was some global statements. Now looking in some regions, we've detected additional changes. So uh, in some regions, there's been a poleward shift in the location of peak intensity. So this means locations like Tokyo or Brisbane, Australia <clears throat> are now more exposed to storms when they're at their strongest. In some regions, we've detected a slowdown of the forward speed. So think of Harvey and Florence, for example. They're grinding to a halt at the uh, coastline. And in some regions, particularly Texas, some studies have detected heavier rain rates in tropical cyclones. Um, so lots of changes have already happened. And there's further changes that have been seen that just haven't passed statistical significance yet. Um, so the overarching question, so why are these changes taking place? Now, that's a very broad question. And today, we're going to tackle a piece of that. So those are changes in TCs. What about the thermodynamic environments? Well, at the same time, those two have changed. So let's think about what, what we know has changed. Thinking about the global tropics now as a whole, we've seen rising seas. Uh, so that would increase the um, extent and depth of uh, surge inundation, inland inundation. We've seen warming upper oceans. So there's more fuel for these tropical cyclones. We've seen a warming troposphere and cooling lower stratosphere. Um, and that's going to be the topic of today's talk. And in turn, this uh, warmer troposphere demands more moisture from the surface. And in assuming relative humidity is constant, we have more water vapor. So many studies have tried to attribute changes in TCs to changes in the thermodynamic environment. Um, it is challenging if you're only looking at observations, because even though we think there's a lot of tropical cyclones, there's actually not that many compared to other weather systems we look at. Um, and also, there's huge decadal or multi-decadal variability in tropical cyclones. So it's very hard to pick out a change signal around all that variability. Particularly in the North Atlantic, it's a problem. But of course, here in M-cubed, we're not um, limited to just looking at observations. We have some very nice uh, M-cubed supported and developed models we can turn to and theory. So, so that was some scientific motivation, more, more after this. How about some societal motivation? Um, so I think it was mentioned um, on this stage a few months back that tropical cyclones contribute about half to the total cost of weather for the United States. So these numbers are compiled by NOAA. Their total losses, total, total economic losses since about 1980. Um, so $1.2 trillion in today's dollars. $1.2 trillion for tropical cyclones. Uh, drought and wildfire is not too far behind. And those costs have been accelerating faster than tropical cyclones. So it'd be interesting to see if it overtakes. <coughs> I was surprised to see how low down flooding was. But uh, maybe that's accelerating as well. So clearly, it's, um, it's a huge problem. We're looking looking at ways to mitigate some of these losses. Um, well, let's just have a look spatially at where these uh, losses from weather in general occur. And you can see the coastal states uh, have some of the highest losses. And this scale, again, by NOAA is nonlinear. So these are really the highest losses. Um, but of course, losses aren't just a function of uh, the weather. It's a function of uh, the exposed value and how it responds to uh, the hazard. So of course, we get peaks in California and New York, where there's a lot of wealth, um, as well as along the coast. 
I'm not sure why iOS stands out there. It must be um, duration. <laughs> I got it. OK. <laughs> so that was a look at the spatial losses. How about the uh, time series of losses? Um, we're just going to look at this uh, orange color. That's the total um, losses, mostly from weather and climate events. And you can see it's rising. This is loss, losses. Sorry. This, these are the frequency of events that cause loss globally, compiled by Munich Re. So it's about tripled over the past 40 years or so. And along with that, the total annual global losses are rising too. So the, um, the red line is actually the insured component, and the blue is the total economic losses. So it, not only is it rising, it seems to be becoming more volatile as well. So you can pick out your favorite US hurricane season, 2005 shows up, 2017. Uh, 2012 was the um, Japan earthquake and Thailand floods. But so losses are rising as well. So the big question is, what do, what do we do in the face of these rising losses to mitigate them? Well, the insurance industry has turned to modeling. They recognize that they can't just use historical observations to characterize the likelihood of a loss happening this year. They need to turn to modeling to fill in the gaps in the historical record. So a quote from an insurance colleague of mine, it's a modeled world. That's the, the, the world they live in and they conduct business in. I might argue that these private risk modeling companies emphasize st statistics over physics. Um, so they're not ideally suited to understanding historical trends in losses or to make projections. So um, I think there's space here for M cubed uh, to enter the picture and provide um, uh, some collaboration because these companies are asking for process level understanding of historical trends and process level understanding of future trends so they can have confidence in the information because they recognize that statistics only takes them so far. Um, and that's where the support of my work and colleagues here in M cubed comes in. OK, so um, for today's talk, we're going to focus on the role of environmental temperature on TC intensity. So why might, why might this be a, an interesting question? <clears throat> well, we've seen significant recent trends in both. So temperature has changed. TC intensity has changed. According to CMIP6, there's significant projected changes ahead in both. And we all already know a lot about the relationship between TZs and temperature. So let me just review what we already know. Um, well, um, studies have made physical connections between the ocean surface temperature, the overlying atmosphere, and TZ intensity. And we've seen it in correlations. So here's an updated figure from a 2007 paper from um, Emmanuel for the not that shows a close correlation between TZ activity and sea surface temperature for the North Atlantic now. So the orange color is a measure of TC activity. It's the power dissipation index, which, which is the cube of the six hourly wind speed, which um, is reportedly uh, correlated with, well, it's the power dissipation uh, which causes damage. So you can see how closely the two follow. I'm not sure what happened in the last decade there. Um, let me know if you, if you have an idea. Um, <clears throat> so we already know about a lot about the um, the role of SSTs. We know less about the role of the atmospheric temperature profile from the surface up to the lower stratosphere. Um, <clears throat> we do have some very nice theory, potential intensity theory, that suggests both the surface and upper air temperature will be important and could contribute to driving TC intensity changes. <laughs> but results from modeling and observations are less clear on that. So, so let's just review this theory that we have. And many of you I know have know this back to front, but I'm reviewing it here today because I want to highlight the roles of temperature. So this is um, potential intensity theory that was developed in the late 80s by Kerry Emanuel and others and modeled by Rich and Kerry <laughs> to support, support the theory. This nice figure I've taken from Daniel Guilford's recent uh, Python script paper, where he, he um, converted this into a community script that we can calculate potential intensity. So 
thanks to him for this nice graphic that I've modified. So here you're looking at a radial cross-section. The hurricane eye is here and the surface is here. So let's just quickly review. Um, the theory posits TCs as heat engines that convert fuel to motion. So, so let's think what happens here. There's four legs of the heat engine. The air is spiraling into the center of the hurricane. It's subsaturated. It therefore can accept heat energy from the surface, <coughs> the ocean surface. So um, that's the heat source or the fuel for the hurricane. And as it does, as it spirals inwards, it, it goes to lower pressure. So it expands isothermally. As it reaches the eye, the air turns upwards and we get condensation. So we have adiabatic expansion here, no change of heat. And then uh, we reach the top here where the, um, the outflow occurs. So this is the heat sink. So we have radiative uh, radiation cooling from the top. Um, this is, and this is depicted by this uh, segment C here now, and it's balanced by some subsidence. So this is approximately an isothermal process. And then in reality, the, um, the outflow gets combined with neighboring weather systems. But to close the loop in this model, uh, they just bring, bring the air back down to the surface through adiabatic compression. So, um, so in summary then, for this theory, the power generated by the engine is determined by the rate of fuel input and the efficiency of the conversion of that fuel to motion. So the rate of fuel input is driven by this, what we call thermodynamic disequilibrium between the ocean and the overlying atmosphere because the overlying atmosphere is not saturated, there's a transfer of heat. Oh, there's also some heating from frictional dissipation that uh, Robert talked about uh, in April, but um, uh, that's, for this talk, we're going to um, concentrate on the thermodynamic disequilibrium contribution. And then the thermodynamic efficiency tells us about the conversion of fuel to motion, and this is determined by the temperature difference between where the heat is input and where it's output from the system. So it's um, the difference between the surface and the outflow temperature divided by the outflow temperature. And it's typically, the efficiency is typically, typically about 33% for TCs. So that was uh, reviewing some of the theory. The nice thing about this theory is that it gives us an expression for the, the speed limit of tropical cyclones. So this is the upper limit, um, otherwise known as potential intensity. And so you're probably familiar with this expression here. So let me just see where temperature enters the picture. So this is the efficiency that we saw on the previous slide. So SSTs in combination with TC outflow temperature would be important for the speed limit. Um, and then we have this disequilibrium term. So it's actually um, formulated here as the difference between the uh, saturated moist static energy at the SST and the moist static energy of the overlying atmosphere. <clears throat> so it would seem that the SST, again, is important and maybe the low level temperatures also. Now there's this, um, these coefficients out the front here, the coefficient of um, enthalpy and momentum exchange that uh, for this talk, we're going to set constant given the uncertainty about them. So with apologies to those who study this in detail. Um, okay, so we've learned a lot about just reviewing the theory here. So we have a quick quiz. So um, it's multiple choice, don't, don't worry. What drives TC intensity change in a changing thermodynamic environment? So we've learned, um, is it A, the changing fuel rate driven by the disequilibrium? Is it B, the changing engine efficiency? Is it C, both contribute equally, they're both important? Or is it D, neither, it's something else? So. Um, if you are joining remotely, you can enter your choice of letters into Slido, if you like, and Dave will put them up on the screen. And if you are here, so who uh, thinks it's A? You can, you can opt out of the entire thing, if you like, as well. So hands up if you think it's A. Okay, a few A's. Hands up if you think it's B. We got a B, two B's. Hands up if you think it's both. Well, popular. Hands up if you think it's D, and <laughs> I, knew, I knew there'd be one. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna ask you what it is after that. <laughs> okay, great. 
Thank you. So the qu specific question we're going to ask now is, to what extent do, does historical environmental temperature change explain the observed trends in the TC intensity distribu distribution? So we're going to explore this using two parts. One, a analysis of the historical TC record. And we're going to look globally on multi-decadal scales in the hope that this would emphasize thermodynamic drivers of the change over other drivers that might vary on smaller scales, such as changes in shear, um, moisture, and uh, any other factor. And then we're going, because the real world is messy, we're going to enter a more controlled environment of idealized axisymmetric models to really try to isolate the role of, of environmental temperature. So let's start with um, historical data analysis. So I'll mention that there's, we've already detected trends, and so let's see what's happened since I was born. Um, I'm actually a bit older than this, but uh, this'll do. So over the past X years, we've seen that uh, carbon dioxide and methane are potent greenhouse gases have risen about 20% in terms of concentration. And I just checked yesterday, and they're now at these values here. So the um, forcing for uh, the greenhouse effect has strengthened. And in response, the atmospheric temperature profile has changed. So I'm showing here that the global troposphere has indeed warmed at two levels. So the top row is 850. The bottom row is 300 hectopascals. <clears throat> um, this is a spatial map of temperature trend in degrees Celsius per decade. Warm colors are, well, warming. Um, and on the right is a time series of annual average tropical temperatures, the average of these values here, within plus or minus 20 degrees for the summer hemispheres. Sorry. And thanks to Andy for processing all this data. So the data is a global, a processed, homogenized glo global radio sound data set by the University of Vienna. So they suggest it's ideal for climate analyses because it's consistent. Of course, one of the downsides is we haven't got data everywhere. You've got these gaps, particularly over the oceans, but I might suggest that the large radius of deformation might make these values representative on large scales. But so the troposphere has warmed. Signific oh, the hatching is significant, but you can see if you take the average, the averages are pretty significant. Um, meanwhile, the global lower stratosphere has cooled. So if you go up to 50 hectopascals, now we've got um, <clears throat> a cooling trend. It's interesting that we have this apparent abrupt shift um, in 1991. So who knows what happened in 1991? Yeah, yeah. So uh, Pinatubo contributed to that shift, but there's many other processes that control the temperature of the lower stratosphere, which I'll... Um, I'll just mention in a couple of, sli couple of slides time. OK, so we've had significant changes. And let's have a look at the data now in terms of the vertical profile. <clears throat> so this is the temperature trend, Kelvin per decade, along the bottom, uh, uh, vertical depth of the atmosphere, <coughs> up the y-axis. Anything to the right of the dashed line is warming. And I'm showing three data sets here. The, the radio sun's in black that you just saw. And then the um, ERA interim and ERA 5 reanalysis, because we have data everywhere. Um, and they're fairly consistent. The, which one? Oh, yeah, the ERA 5 is, no, the ERA interim assimilates the radio sun, so it's not surprising they, they agree better. And the dots are the SST. So the SST has warmed in response, the lower atmosphere has warmed, and convection uh, takes it up a new moist adiabat. That's where you get this peak warming in the upper troposphere. Uh, meanwhile, we saw the tr lower stratosphere has cooled. So we mentioned Pinatubo, but there's also changes in ozone and this um, overturning Brewer-Dobson circulation. Um, I'm not going to go into details, but there's a summary of all these processes in this paper here. Um, it's fairly complex. OK, so let's think about how TCs might respond to these trends. Um, so we've got SST warming. I might argue that might increase the fuel rate. I actually didn't calculate the thermal disequilibrium in these data, but I should have done when I was putting these slides together. Um, we also have um, this maximum warming aloft. So you, you might think that this might reduce buoyancy of the, um, 
the plumes, or are they bubbles? Um, and it might lead to lower warmer outflows, um, which would lead to lower engine efficiency. That's one hypothesis. And then this cooling, we've got potential for efficiency gains because the outflow temperature for strong storms that might have outflow higher up in the atmosphere might benefit from this cooling lower stratosphere, increasing efficiency and therefore intensity. So these are my expectations. Oh, yeah. I guess you said you didn't do the delta T, the ocean atmosphere. Image. But, no. but from this figure, it seems to imply that the atmosphere is warming a little bit faster than the ocean. Am I, am I interpreting that correctly? Yeah. No, I, I also was looking at that. Um, these are tr tropical average, so I'm not sure how representative of a, the hurricane environment, which can form where the SST is not quite in equilibrium with the overlying atmosphere. So yeah, a more careful investigation of the data is needed, yeah. Yeah, thanks. OK, so at the same time as temperatures have changed, so to have tropical cyclone intensity, <clears throat> and we have two TC intensity records that we can turn to here to look at detected trends. Uh, one is the IB tracks that probably a lot of us have used. This is the um, uh, combination of reported TC location intensity information from many regional centers that are combined and merged into a global product using multiple observing systems that change over time. Whereas Jim Cosson reanalyzed the intensity of the IB tracks locations using satellite data. So the idea was that he's created a homogeneous record using the same, same methods, same data through time since the 1980s. So there's a benefit there to looking at trends. Uh, you can see the obvious differences in the intensity distribution between these data sets. There's an issue in the COSIN data set. He used the Dvorak technique to infer wind speed from satellite imagery. Um, there's an issue when the eyes are obscured by Cirrus because the algorithm doesn't know there's an eye, even though there might be one. So it puts it at a lower intensity, and then suddenly the Cirrus clears, and it sees an eye, and it leaps forward. So that is a limitation, but um, overall, it's more appropriate to, for looking at climate trends, so that's what we're going to continue with. Um, actually, I'm showing both data sets again here. So <clears throat> how has the distribution changed? Um, apologies for all, for all the colors, but uh, the bluer colors, uh, the COSIN data set, the satellite-derived data set, the warmer colors are the IB tracks. Each line is an historical decade from the 80s to the 2010s. Um, it's difficult to see, so I've blown up the intense end of the distribution here. <clears throat> and if you just look at the warm colors, you see yellow down here, and it's the proportion of the intense storm goes up in IB tracks. And it's difficult to see, I know, but the, in the blue colors, they're getting darker as you go, go higher. So in both data sets, the distribution has become increasingly bimodal. There's a higher fraction at the intense end, a lower fraction at the, um, the weaker end. So now we try to put these two trends together. Now, it's important. On these slides, I'm not saying anything about causality. I'm just looking at statistical relationships between the two trends. And I'm making the case that the strongest storms intensify the most per unit surface uh, warming in this figure here. So let me show you what you're looking at here. <clears throat> so at the y-axis, this is the trend in intensity. So it's dv dsst. So for every unit warming SST, the intensity goes up by like one meter a second, two meter a second, okay? And I've, this is a quantile regression, so we're not just looking at the, the median, we're looking at all quantiles um, along the bottom here. And so if you want to know which quantile is a hurricane, it's this dashed line here. So anything to the right of the dashed line is hurricane category one, two, three, four. Anything to the left is tropical storms. So you can see the response or the sensitivity of intensity varies by the intensity quantile itself. So for tropical storms, they go up about half a meter per second. Um, well, getting back to this question, is it local SST or, well, I don't know how to define it. Yeah, yeah, good question. Average SST as your previous slide. 
Yeah, thank you. I Could didn't you, mention. Uh, repeat it, the question for, uh, for oh, the yes. home audience. Thank you, yeah. Um, so the question was, the SST that we're looking at here, is it local or is it, say, a, a larger scale average over the tropics? It's indeed local. So I took the location of the lifetime maximum intensity of all historical storms and then went back two days as an estimate at the location of the SST and took that SST over an average over a radius. So thank you, because that's important. Um, OK. So strongest storms are more sensitive to SST, it appears. How about sensitivity to upper level temperatures? Well, maybe it's no surprise that the figures look similar because there's such strong correlation between temperature at 300 hectopascals and the SST, as you'd expect. OK. Well, now let's have a look at um, the relationship to lower stratosphere <clears throat> temperatures. And apologies here, I should have flipped it. There's too many negatives involved here. So this is, again, this is the uh, sensitivity of intensity to 50 hectopascal temperature. So if, so if you warm the stratosphere, the storms weaken. OK, I should have flipped it. But it's not significant for hurricanes. The, um, these are error bars on the trend, or confidence intervals on the trend, and it doesn't depart from zero. So. This is against my expectation. I thought the strong storms that might reach the cooling stratosphere might benefit from that cooling. Interesting. Now, real world is messy. There's shear influence. There's dry air influence. You know, does it even make sense to correlate uh, tropical storms with stratosphere? Because the, they're probably really shallow. So. in two slides time. That's where I hit my limit, and then we'll move on to idealized modeling. But actually, a point that uh, was just raised just now, I'm going to look at um, that it matters whether you look at storm local environment or average over the tropics. So I dug into the data a bit deeper. <clears throat> in this figure, you've seen this format before. The orange is for the tropical average trend. The blue now is the trend in the temperature profile around hurricane environments. And it's significantly different than the tropical trend. And the SSTs are given here. So again, um, it doesn't support what, what we were just discussing about disequilibrium. But um, it seemed the SST is at least moving in concert with the, um, the overlying atmosphere that's responding to it. And maybe the differences are washing out above the boundary layer because of the um, weak temperature gradient uh, approximation. But I thought it was interesting that the hurricane environments are changing differently to the tropical mean. And this would have implications for climate change studies that use the pseudo-global warming method. So th that method is, is a way to answer the question, what would, say, Hurricane Harvey look like if it happened again in, at the end of the century? And you add a, a warming delta to reanalysis and run your wolf model again and look at the impact of the warming. But if you, your CMIT-5 delta might be more consistent with the orange profile, the tropical mean, rather than a hurricane profile, which might be different and affect the response. So I thought this was an interesting result. OK, so let's just review what we've learned so far. The global troposphere has warmed. The lower stratosphere has cooled. At the same time, the TC intensity distribution has become increasingly bimodal. Uh, look, the strongest storms have intensified the most per unit surface and upper tropospheric warming. Uh, I didn't see much strength in the relationship with stratospheric cooling. Um, <clears throat> and the point just made that it matters whether you look locally or for the tropical mean. OK, well, let's now become a bit more constrained and move to um, a very idealized environment to really better hone in on the response of TC intensity to, um, to the temperature. So this is the piece that um, Gary led, but I think I know enough to uh, present it. <clears throat> so he used um, CM1. We gave it this in an axisymmetric uh, setup, so height, radius. Um, and this is the profile we gave it. So this is the Donian so-called moist tropical sounding. It's um, an average of soundings over the North Atlant tropical deep North Atlantic about the year 2000. Uh, you can see there's cape in this sounding. So um, it's definitely not neutral to 
convection or even mo model convection. We set the SST to be very similar to the lowest model level atmospheric temperature. Um, four kilometer grid spacing extends to uh, 1,500 kilometers and actually the grid stretches as we go out to where we're not interested. Um, we ran a 21-member physics ensemble, so we varied the turbulence, microphysics, radiation, parameterizations to make sure the signal wasn't um, getting mixed up with uncertain parameterizations. And we initialized with a weak vortex. Um, and thanks to um, some of Rich and George's work that informed some of this uh, setup. We only ran for eight days. Um, to achieve full equilibrium, you want to run for much longer, but um, we were really interested in the peak intensity and there were some issues with drying if you run for, for longer. Okay. So we're going to impose various changes to that Dunian sounding <clears throat> uh, based on the observed temperature trend. So we're going to linearly extrapolate the historical trend to the mid-century in blue and the end of century in red and apply these changes to that sounding. And then we're going to take that red end of century profile and change it a little by removing that upper warming maximum. So the difference between the red and the orange there, we've removed the upper warming. And then again, we're gonna remove the stratospheric cooling from the end of the century profile. And then finally, we're going to, instead of extrapolating historical trends, we're going to give it a projected trend according to CMIT 5 under RCP 8.5. And interestingly, this trend is more than twice the magnitude of the, if we just extrapolate history. So. According to CMIT 5, warming is accelerating. Okay. So you the SST fixed? Uh, no, the SST changed similarly to the lowest model level, yeah. And relative humidity is constant. Yeah. Okay, so we ran our 21 on physics ensemble for every scenario. <clears throat> and here's the ensemble mean time series or intensification of the system, reaches a peak intensity and then kind of reaches some kind of equilibrium even just after six to eight days. Um, the first thing you'll notice is the how on top the lines are. You know, The changes are not huge. The only significant change was the intensity between the control run and, and the end, all the end of century runs. There was no significant change whether we changed the upper warming maximum or if we remove the stratospheric cooling. So, um, again, I was surprised about the lack of the role of the stratospheric cooling. Um, but we're gonna dig into that. Okay, so um, we're going to look at the reasons for the changes in the numerical simulations and see if they, <coughs> see if they support uh, potential intensity theory and then we're gonna pull apart which of the components are driving the changes in the numerical model. Now to um, calculate efficiency, we need to def we define an outflow temperature. And in the model, we do that um, after a six day simulation, um, we can look at the mature uh, TC and look at the hydrometeors. So here's a, um, a snapshot from one of Gary's simulations of hydrometeor concentrations. The, the rainwater, cloud water is in green, the frozen hydrometeors are in purple. So we look, to, to define the outflow, we looked at grid points where cloud ice exceeds a threshold and the radial wind exceeds an outward uh, speed. So it's pretty much all over here is our, I should have added it. <clears throat> so that's our outflow temperature in the simulations. So if we go back to our heat engine, so for heat engines, the, um, the maximum wind, the square of the maximum wind speed is proportional to the product of efficiency in DC equilibrium. So let's have a look at how the left-hand side and the right-hand side changes in our numerical simulations. The, the numbers in the table here are the percent change relative to the control simulation. So the magnitude of the change, or the relative magnitude of the change to the control. So if this expression balances, they should be similar. 
And it's easier to see if they are similar if I just plot it on a scatter plot here. So um, they are indeed fairly slim similar. So this suggests that the, numerical simu the numerically simulated TCs are following potential intensity theory. Well, that's good. There was one outlier, <clears throat> this one here, where if we re remove the upper warming maximum, the uh, simulated TC increases intensity, but it appears not to be driven by um, efficiency or disequilibrium changes. So some mismatch there. Maybe it's something to do with the, the way convection is represented in, in theory versus the numerical model. I haven't dug into it. So let's see which was most important in <coughs> dictating our intensity change. So now I'm looking at the percent change in disequilibrium and efficiency separately. So this is, remember again, this is the percent change relative to the control intensity. So obviously, as we go into the future, the, um, the disequilibrium increases <coughs> as we um, warm the SST and the profile. But look at the efficiency. It basically stays flat. So there's no change in efficiency, no matter what we do to the upper temperatures. So this is odd, because the, the efficiency um, is a function of the SST and the outflow temperature. And you'd think that because we've removed the stratospheric cooling or we've removed the upper tropospheric warming that the outflow temperature would change, but it's not. So what is the outflow temperature? Well, it's um, constant, no matter what we do to the upper stratification. So this is weird. Um, but now let's have a look at the pressure of the outflow. And you can see that the TC is becoming taller. It really wants to find that temperature, no matter what we do to the profile. So um, thanks to uh, Chris, actually, who suggested uh, we consider the uh, fixed anvil temperature hypothesis. So this is a hypothesis for what sets the outflow height of tropical convection. So this is, I'm not just talking about hurricanes now, but tropical convection in general. <clears throat> so it was, the theory was put forward by Hartman and Larson and then supported by numerical uh, cloud resolving simulations in that later paper. So let me just walk you through what this uh, theory tells us. Um, and then I'm gonna explain it in three parts. <clears throat> So if you think about the clear sky tropics, we have radiative cooling, and that largely happens through water vapor. And we know that uh, water vapor will tail off with the, as it gets colder with height. So we have a, a vertical gradient of radiative cooling. So it'll start at some level and increase into the troposphere. Okay. Now, uh, that cooling is balanced by subsidence warming and deep convection, which I'll come into in the third point. But if we think about uh, clear sky subsidence first now, um, <clears throat> so that'll start at the level of this gradient of cooling and it'll accelerate into the troposphere. Um, so this will set up a upper level of convergence. And according to this theory, that's what sets the outflow of deep convection um, through mass con con uh, conservation. Um, so if you think about it, the outflow of deep tropical convection, if you go back all the steps, is determined by radiative, the gradient of the radiative cooling, which is entirely determined by temperature because the radiative cooling is occurring through water vapor, which is uh, controlled by the temperature through classes clapeyron. So it's um, pretty interesting how it's the um, saturation vapor pressure dependence on temperature that appears to set the outflow height of convection. So if you, if you buy into this theory, the next question you might ask, well, has anyone actually looked at uh, hurricane data to see if we've seen a constant outflow temperature? So the closest thing I could find, I talked to Jim Cosson about this because he has his uh, historical record of satellite Data, satellite imagery of um, global TCs at their lifetime maximum intensity. And from that, from the um, brightness temperature, you can define outflow temperature. So I need to ask you to ignore all the colored lines here because I just grabbed this from his paper. Uh, see if you can only look at the black line, which is the time series of the annual average outflow temperature according to his satellite data. And there's huge internal variability 
This is the annual global average. Huge interannual variability, but according to him, there's, there's no trend. Um, so that might support it. I'd want to do a more careful analysis of his data to be sure, but because his paper didn't explore this hypothesis. But, but um, actually, uh, this later paper in cloud resolving modeling also found evidence for fixed outflow temperature of TCs. So in an idealized modeling, that would support this hypothesis. So, um, OK, so we're coming to the end. So what did we just learn? Um, well, in CM1, the CM1 simulated intensity changes sought according to theoretical expectations. However, the, um, the changes are very small. So clearly, in the real world, the, um, the intensity changes are driven by other factors than the changes in the thermal profile. We've seen they operate as heat engines supporting the theory. <clears throat> so the answer to the quiz, if you if you want to stay in the model world, is that it was disequilibrium that changes the uh, ch change in intensity. You weren't the only one, George. <laughs> um, and it appears that the outflow temperatures are remarkably stable. That's why efficiency was mute. Efficiency role was muted. And I said that. Okay, so how? Well, maybe I'll speed up a little bit. Um, I think it would be interesting to look regionally at um, whether these results hold according to different vertical profiles of the different basins. And you know, we only ran the simulations with an Atlantic profile. It would be interesting to run with a Pacific, uh, South Pacific profile. And then I really want to dig into why applications of potential intensity code to various data sets do respond to stratospheric cooling. So I haven't shown that, but um, if you calculate potential intensity um, under different profiles, then stratospheric cooling appears to drive the intensity change. So I, I want to look into why that seems not to agree with the modeling uh, study. OK, well, I, I just wanted to finish by um, <clears throat> saying a few words about collaboration with reinsurance, because the work I've just presented was paid for by them. So why are they interested and why do I benefit? Well, this is how they um, pitch their research network to their clients. This is taken from their web page. Um, so they fund academic uh, researchers in various disciplines, not just um, weather and climate, but also economics and terrorism risk and all sorts of risks. Um, so. In terms of weather and climate, what is potentially insurable? Well, um, what I normally think of is physical risk, so damage to assets from weather events. But there's also two other categories of risk that are potentially insurable. One is this transition risk. This is the transition to a low energy economy. So if you are invested in, say, the airline industry and people suddenly stop flying, then you are exposed to this kind of risk. And so you might want to mitigate that risk. And then the final category is liability risk. So increasingly, companies are regulated um, to understand weather and climate risk to their business and be solvent to its impacts. And they can be sued if they are not viewed as being um, sufficiently um, climate savvy. So, but most of my work is relevant to physical risk. So um, why do I collaborate with insurance? Well, primarily, it's a common scientific interest. So we're both interested in process level understanding of weather and climate events and their changes in a changing climate. Um, they're also scientifically savvy. So a lot of the people I work with have PhDs in atmospheric science. So it's a very easy conversation. But these two points, I, there's nothing unique about insurance about them. But the third point is what's unique. For me, it inspires new fundamental science questions. So they view weather and climate science through a business lens, which is very different and something that many of us are not um, privy to. And so that, that means they ask different questions. And so I can view my fundamental science in new ways that I wouldn't have otherwise thought of. So for example, some projects I'm working on that has been inspired by these collaborations are physical connections between extreme events globally and I'm also working on a new project looking at the relationship between TC wind and rain across different uh, scales. 
and it provides steady streams of funding. So I've been working with Willis for uh, many years now, and they provide direct funding and indirect funding. So I've been able to leverage some of this work and attract other funding. So it works really nice. And I think there's an opportunity here to expand these kind of relationships more broadly across NCAR. So in my remaining minutes, uh, these are just some areas that I think are ripe for collaboration. These are areas that I know they're interested in understanding and that I know m -cubed in particular has the expertise to um, have a fruitful collaboration. So of course they ensure assets. Uh, they're very interested in extremes in the urban boundary layer, also height resolved extremes um, they're very interested. And I should say, I don't take any ownership over any of this. I know some of you are already working with industry. So um, um, they're very interested in straight line winds and tornado swaths. So the surface footprint of the, the, um, the wind field of these events, they don't know much about it, but it really defines their risk. They're very interested in um, archive reforecasts. So they call them counterfactuals. They think of them as possibilities that are plausible, physically realistic, but they didn't happen to happen in the real world, but they could have happened. So if you imagine an ensemble hurricane forecast, only one actually happens in the real world, but they want the whole for ensemble to run through their loss models and understand their risk better. And then my final point is they really want local information on probabilities of extremes, but within but while retaining global connections, because they want these connections between the events. So MPAS seems ideal to provide this kind of information. So I think that this kind of deeper collaboration could inform uh, NCAR community modeling, not only to strengthen our science, but also to um, make it more likely that the results will be used. So one step in that direction, I'm actually planning interviews with my insurance colleagues to better understand some of these opportunities and better understand how an effective collaboration could work and benefit both. So if you're interested in like, adding specific questions for my interview protocol or getting involved with the actual interviews, then please let me know. And I'll leave it there. So thanks very much, everyone. Okay, we have some uh, time for questions or comments. Yeah, the, out, the outflow temperature is very interesting. Um, is this a global thing? Because that would seem to be related, should be related to the tropopause height. Um, so mid latitudes or higher latitudes, the tropopause height is lower and probably warmer as well. And so is this tropical or global? Yeah, uh, I think it is global because I was <coughs> talking to Jim Cosson. He's seen a poleward shift in the locations of where that, that um, time series I showed with no trend in the observed outflow temperature. Um, he thinks part of that is attributed to uh, the poleward migration of whether the hurricanes reach their maximum intensity. So presumably that is extending into the gradient of the tropopores. Um, but yeah, it needs looking into to try and explain it. Seems the major take from your talk is, well, my take is importance to distinguish global tropical temperature change and what you call TC environment that defines the tropical cycle intensity. And, um, and the second part was robust. Well, you, you talk up with two perspectives, but how can I say this? Uh, how, I guess, remaining question is how this local tropical cyclone environment is, the, is influenced by global change of tropical environment. Mm -hmm. And that seems to me a major gap in this talk. Yeah. And other thing is, well, you talk about TC environment, both in observation and modeling. 
And it seems if there's ambiguity how to define this immediate environment for tropical cyclone. So two questions combined together. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, <clears throat> and then, well, firstly, we'll need, we would need to understand why the hurricane environments are changing differently to the global mean, um, the processes that are um, changing the environments. Is it that the hurricanes are sampling the large scale environment differently, like moving to higher latitudes or different parts of the season or the shifts in the basin frequencies? Or is it something that the in situ local environments themselves are changing? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't have an answer, but yeah, the story continues and that, that certainly needs investigating. And maybe I'll just add that it's not just hurricane environments that are changing differently to the mean, it's other studies have shown that like MCS environments are changing differently to say the mean summer over the Midwest. So it seems to be that strong weather systems occupy environments that are changing differently. Uh, this is an interesting topic. Uh, James, I was just curious. You said you held the exchange coefficients constant. <laughs> I mean, uh, they have tremendous leverage over it. Would it just overwhelm the kinds of things that you saw if you actually let them vary? No, that's a good question. I, I, I kept them constant and kept my, <laughs> kept my eye on the profile, but I didn't allow them to vary, but we should do to understand the, 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 the role of it. Yeah, yeah, good point. Um, yeah, you mentioned uh, rainfall. Uh, did you look at the rain coming out of your future idealized storms? And no, we didn't actually, more, yeah. Must, must be a lot more rain coming out of these uh, idealized storms. We should look into it, yeah. <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> There's a lot to look at, yeah. yeah. Okay. No, that's a good point. No, thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, we will uh, continue. To, oh, Chris. You well, I'll ask the question. <laughs> <laughs> You're just resting your arm. Right? <laughs> Never just rest your arm. So James, um, I, can we put to rest this whole static stability argument then? You had a slide about that. Yeah. And it seems like the, this fixed anvil temperature just says that's a, irrelevant. Would you agree? Are you, are you talking about static stability in the upper? So the argument being higher static stability is somehow going to inhibit intensity. Yes. Which I think is rubbish. Yeah. OK. Um, Well, yeah, again, I think it, it would need more careful analysis because I, I think I was looking at um, the profiles on large scales, which have already been more in equilibrium. So it'd be interesting to look a bit more carefully on the profiles more specific to TCs. Uh, but yeah, but I'll, uh, I'll explore it. Thank you. OK, uh, any further questions or comments? Let's. Uh Save them for the uh, after seminar little uh, gathering out here. Great. And uh, thanks again, James.